Tonight on the Astronomy Show, 10,000 British Columbians go into space, and we find out why. Eric Dunn gives us an update on Comet Yakutaki. Barry Shanko interviews Gary Saronic on the new planetarium show on Jupiter. David Dodge with Astro News. All this and more on the Astronomy Show. up on Comet Hyakutake. It's Comet Hyakutake 1996b2. Ask for them by their brand names and accept no substitutes. It's pretty much been and gone, but it will be long remembered, and fondly so, as the great comet of 1996. It has been a little dimmer than expected in recent weeks. Uh, it rounded the sun on May 1st, and it didn't quite reach the maximum brightness that had been predicted. They had talked originally about it getting into the negative magnitudes, which puts it at the same sort of brightness as you might have noticed Venus in recent weeks, uh, absolutely brilliant and completely unmistakable object, low in the northwest in the evening twilight. But it didn't quite make it to that height of brightness. It managed to get somewhere around plus 0 0.5 in magnitude terms, which is still quite respectable, but given the brightness of the twilight sky around it, made it a little harder to see. It has been something of a challenge object to the naked eye from urban skies, although from nice, clear uh, country skies, it has still been an easy sight to see, and it's been a beautiful sight in binoculars. It's also been the target of a lot of scientific attention. Uh, it has been targeted by radar astronomers, those poor, frustrated souls who have very few things to examine. There aren't that many things in space that are close enough you can bounce a radar signal off them. And they did try with Comet Hyakutake. They did get a return. And the results were a little surprising. We are interpreting them as meaning the comet's nucleus, the more or less solid part, the iceberg, if you like, which is creating the, the tail and all the other phenomena we've been uh, enjoying, seems to be only about three kilometers in diameter. This is about a third the size that we'd been expecting. It had been thought to be something around the order of nine or 10. And it appears to be quite a bit smaller. One of the, also, the things they also found from the radar traces were that uh, things were coming off this comet at quite a rate. Uh, the small, solid bits, particles on the order of about a centimeter or so in size, were being fired out of this thing. And again, if you think of it as a, being like an iceberg, there are, in effect, geysers blowing off this thing at various points. And they're apparently blowing stuff out at quite a rate of knots, uh, uh, material coming out at some tens of meters per second. And this would be the sort of speed that would make it rather hazardous to investigate if we ever get humans out to a comet, or at least a comet like Yakutake. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that could puncture a spacesuit quite handily. So adds an interesting element of uh, dramatic danger, I guess, to comet exploration. Perhaps the most surprising result that's come out of it is an X-ray detection. Uh, scientists using the German ROSAT X-ray satellite managed to sweet talk their uh, schedulers into pointing the satellite at the comet. No one had any good reason at all to expect x-rays out of a comet. There's no obvious mechanism by which a comet could generate x-rays. And this was sort of almost, I think, done in the expectation of getting a negative result that would confirm everybody's preconceived ideas. And as happens so delightfully often in science, the preconceived ideas went up in smoke because they got a very good x-ray signal from the comet, and a sort of crescent-shaped cloud of x-ray active stuff no one knows quite what, on the sunward side of the comet. And the theorists are uh, scratching their heads mightily to try to make some sense of this. For observers from Earth, it is, as I say, pretty much been and gone, uh, unless you're going to the southern hemisphere. If you have reason to be south of the equator in the next month or two, it will be there, uh, or at least it will be visible from there. In the morning skies, if you are going south of the equator, uh, take along some binoculars with you if you have a chance to get up early Check out the low horizon in the, uh, the eastern skies just prior to sunrise. You may have a few more glimpses of Comet Hyakutake before it once again heads back into the cold wastes of the outer solar system where it will spend the next many thousand years. Or at least that's what our computer programs are telling us and what we read about. 
here in the southwest BC area, we've had, well, as I tape this, uh, we've had exactly one evening well suited to comet observing in the last month. So for all I can say from actual personal experience, the comet may actually be in the constellation Fornax dancing the boogaloo with the ghost of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. But we are told that it is still visible, and uh, for those lucky enough to be heading south, you might want to give it one more look. For The Astronomy Show, I'm Eric Dunn. Soon there are going to be 10,000 British Columbians uh, orbiting around the Earth. Uh, do you want to tell me about why uh, there's such an exodus and who they are? <laughs> who they are, sure. Actually, they're, they're uh, kind of small British Columbians. They're going to be embryos of uh, one of the starfish that you find commonly on the beach here, the one, the one that we've got right here, which is the purple one that everybody sees on the beach. And what we're going to do is we're going to be launching some of the, we're going to want to breed these animals, and then we're going to put uh, um, some of the little, little embryos that uh, they produce in some of these little plastic aquarium chambers and then those are going to be sent up in a special device um, in the shuttle. And uh, <clears throat> basically, we're looking at several questions. We're looking at development overall, in other words, to make sure that they develop normally and that organisms can develop normally in, in space. And you could say, well, why something this, you know, why, why, why go for a starfish? Be, and I guess the reason there is it's nice and simple. So we can start and see whether a simple organism goes well, and then after that, maybe, uh, so we'll get some ideas of how we might, uh, or what we might look for in uh, more complex organisms in development. Hopefully it'll give us some clues as to, as to development of more complex organisms. Our specific, initial specific thing anyway, was to look at the development of the muscle. And they develop a nice musculature around the esophagus. And of course muscle is one of the things that's really affected by zero gravity. So. Uh, we thought, well, muscle would be a very good thing to look at because everybody else is looking at the osteoporosis. So we figured, well, somebody should look at the muscle and we'll see what it looks like. So uh, we were going to look very carefully at the pattern of development of these cells and whether they could get to where they were supposed to be and whether they form muscle correctly and whether the muscle functioned correctly. And we, uh, that's our main objective. But uh, during the course of sort of setting up for those studies, we realized that there were a couple of targets of opportunity that we could that we could get and that is that uh, these guys actually detect um, gravity and so uh, we were sort of trying to figure out well if you live in an aquatic environment how do you detect gravity so that was one of the other things that we we were looking at because in fact although they have no device themselves to detect gravity they have some simple uh, structures on their surface that are very much like the cells in the inside of our ears that help us detect gravity and we'd like to see what uh, the zero gravity does to those the development of that. And the, uh, the final thing is that these guys develop some behavior that's oriented towards gravity. And we'd like, we want to know whether they can learn it when there's no gravity there. And if they can't, whether they can relearn it when they get back down to Earth or whether they forever pass the ability to learn it. So um, there's several you know, some interesting things that we can get at. So, so the muscles of, of people in space sort of, uh, I guess, what's the word, uh, atrophy, well, atrophy, uh, yeah. atrophy, somewhat like uh, if, if you spent months on end in, in right. bed. In and bed, uh, yeah. So uh, um, this might have some application for, for, for people, like, for, for example, sure. disabled people. And there's, a, there's a good possibility that we'll learn something about how muscle develops and how muscle reacts and, and, and to zero G and how it um, undergoes, as you say, atrophy. Because the muscle in space, muscle of people in space undergoes atrophy very, mu very much more quickly than even people in bed. So uh, we're hoping that we'll get some information with regard to that, yes. Okay, and the, uh, um, the uh, detecting, detecting gravity and balance, we're how this works, how this works in, in humans or animals, for that matter, is still largely a, a, a mystery. Uh, how we figure out you know, which way is up, you know, when uh, when when we don't have the usual visual or other cues. Yeah, we do have a device to do it, and we sort of have an idea of how it works. But it doesn't actually work very well in humans when when they don't have visual cues. That's true. 
and as I say, these guys have a device on their cell on the surfaces of their some of their cells that are very similar to ours, and so we would like to see whether they're related to uh, these guys' ability to detect gravity. Yeah. And we hope by looking at the way they, they develop in gravity, that'll tell us something. And of course, in the end, if we learn something about how simple, again, a simple system detects gravity, maybe we'll learn a little more about how our more complex one does. That's right, and this would have a, an effect on uh, our knowledge of motion sickness and space sickness and things like yes, that. Yes, it could. It's a, I mean, that's a, that's a long stretch. I, 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 right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't say that, but, but yeah, sure, in the end, that's, that's the type of thing that we're looking, we're heading at, trying to, trying to find out. I want to ask you a little bit about the engineering. Uh, do you want to show me all this, uh, this uh, the, uh, the containment little, the devices you have here? Yes. Okay. Basically, we have these, uh, these little aquaria. And this is, um, this is one of, of uh, actually, 12 modules that goes inside a suitcase size um, box and the suitcase size box is called the Aquatic Research Facility or R for short and um, basically the aquaria itself are just here and they take about 30 mils and since the embryos are only a, are less than a millimeter in size um, we can get a thousand or fifteen hundred embryos in each one of these. Okay then <coughs> each one of these can actually be preserved at a given time dependent upon um, what the scientist wants, and that's actually done by a computer that's actually on board the ARC. The ARC has its own little computer, and the idea is that uh, this takes um, this takes the place of the astronaut who's busy, so he doesn't have to come in and inject the preservative each time it, it's necessary, and he doesn't have to remember to do it. The computer does it automatically, and uh, those little things that do that are little little uh, sort of syringes down in here that are electrically op operated and. At squish the fixative into here. Now, when uh, there's there's uh, preservative chemicals present, NASA requires that there's three levels of containment, so that um, this is only one level of containment. So we have to have two more, and this is a uh, the second level. So once this is filled, it goes into this bag, and the bag is sealed up. And then uh, once all that's together, it goes into this little compartment here. And that's sealed up, and then it's this structure that actually goes into the, um, the aquatic research facility into one of the, the centrifuge uh, or turntables that are uh, present in the, in the box. Okay, so uh, um, these, uh, some of the embryos will be preserved uh, early in the flight, midway through the flight, and then, and then you right. wanted to look at what happens uh, with some of them when so they readapt. Some of them we're going to try and bring home, yes. <laughs> so, but the one thing that we, al we always said we'd love to be able to do is we, it's too bad we can't, we probably won't be able to, but it's too bad we can't take two or three, rear them through and turn them loose on the beach. That'd be something to say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere on this beach there are some starfish that have gone into space, but I don't know whether we'll quite get that far. <laughs> yeah. Jupiter, I suppose because it, it, it does something uh, very, every night Jupiter looks different and although the other planets are certainly rewarding to look at in a telescope, uh, Jupiter every night looks different. You never know what you're going to see from one night to the next and it changes so dramatically and over such short time spans. I mean, one year you will see the red spot being very prominent, for example, next year it'll be gone completely. Um, and even on a night-by-night -night basis, or even within the span of a night, because of Jupiter's rapid rotation uh, under 10 hours, new features come into view continuously all night long. And that's contrasted against planets like Mars, uh, which, although are interesting, um, don't really change dramatically uh, from time to time the way Jupiter does, and Saturn as well being beautiful, but really not changing much. So you never know what you're going to get when you turn the telescope on Jupiter, and that's probably one reason why. So I guess this leads into the question, I, I understand you, you sketch Jupiter quite often when you're at the telescope. Mm. Do you find this relaxing or, or why do you do this? Um, difficult to say really. Uh, apart from, uh, I'd like to remember what it looked like on that night. Uh, some people do it because they, they, there is some scientific value in doing that. Uh, although the way I do it is purely recreational. It's simply so that I record what I saw that night 
10 years later, I can look back on the sketches and say, oh, yes, that's what it was doing then, and look how different it is now, particularly when it's uh, an event like the impact of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. Um, you know, I look back on those sketches, and they remind me quite well of what it looked like to me with my telescope that night in that location. And that kind of memory, you, you simply can't get any other way. I can look at photographs of the event, but I don't relate to the photographs in the same way. And there's also a practical reason as well. It really trains your eye. Um, you see much more when you actually take the time to sketch, because in the process of producing a sketch, you, uh, you're always asking questions about what you're seeing. Did I see this little feature or not? So you look, and you look, and you look, and eventually you confirm uh, that you saw this little feature, and you sketch it. Now, did it look like this, or did it look like that? And it, and it really trains your eye uh, to, to see just what's there. A casual glance at any planet will really tell you very little. It's when you really take the time to look at it carefully, and sketching kind of disciplines you into doing that. So that's probably another reason as well. Um, I suppose this leads into how did all your interest in Jupiter prepare you for writing the planetarium show you're working on? Ooh, uh, I think I was probably wound up doing that out of sheer laziness, um, avoiding real work, I suppose. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to tie my interest in astronomy into my work. And uh, although I've had a work, uh, different work over the years, uh, this is, it's most satisfying because it doesn't really require me to do anything I wouldn't otherwise do anyway. Um, that's really the only reason I can sort of give, uh, apart from the fact that I wrote a proposal for this, for the show, and it was chosen instead of other proposals, and what went into that process, I can only speculate. But in any case, yeah, I, I wound up having to do the show. And what's the hardest thing about writing a planetarium show, from your point of view? Um, hmm. Well, they're not easy to write because you have to always be aware of the visual component as well. And I think that this is different in, than in film, because in film you can pretty well put anything up on screen that you can write. Uh, in the planetarium, that's not always so. You have a, a limited number of tools, a limited number of um, effects that you can bring to bear. And because we at the planetarium don't have an unlimited budget, uh, that, that is the case. Um, so you have to write with that in mind. And it is a unique, um, it is a unique medium. It's not like TV. It's not like film. It's not like radio. It's not like anything but what it is, a uh, planetarium show. And I don't know of any way of preparing for doing that apart from actually doing it. And I've had the fortune to have done a couple shows before, although not, not as ambitious as this one. So I kind of knew what I was getting in for. And I um, was happy to do this show because it was about something I was interested in. So. OK, I'm a member of the public. I've just seen your show. What impressions do you want me to carry out after I've, after I've seen it? Oh, I shouldn't have to tell you if you're a member of the public and <laughs> you've just seen the show. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess right, right now, uh, my, my biggest concern is how well the broader themes are going to carry out into the parking lot of the planetarium. Um, these things, by their very nature, tend to be uh, the more subtle aspects of the show. I don't want people to come and just see a show about Jupiter or just about the Galileo probe, because there's a more fundamental issue at, at play, and that is, why does anybody bother to send a space probe out to Jupiter? What would compel a government to spend taxpayers' money on this enterprise? And I think the answers are, are pretty interesting to think about, because um, we do so little nowadays, unless it can be justified in some sort of bottom line mentality, and yet we do this. Um, when one sort of tallies up the score in terms of the things that humanity does that are bad and weighs them against the things that are good, for all the bad things that are done and all the bad things that we have done not only to this planet uh, but to each other and that, we can at least point to this, a Galileo space probe to Jupiter, uh, an Apollo landing, uh, a Voyager mission, and say, at least we could do that. You know, at least in spite of all the bad stuff, we still did that. And there's no reason for doing it apart from some innate urge within the species that forces us to do that. Um, now that is, that is one of the broad themes that I'd like people to sort of consider in the show because the show is not specifically about things. It's about the sort of the broader issue of throughout history we've repeatedly done this. So it tells us this is something consistent within the species. 
in a way, the show has more to do with the people sitting in the chairs in the audience than it does with the probe going to Jupiter. And that's the sort of level on which I hope that they'll consider the show as they're leaving, you know, and maybe it'll be a little more thought-provoking without uh, being too happy about it. way to space was paved very well for me by the three people, three Canadians that went to space before me. They did excellent work for Canada uh, and they developed a great reputation for Canadian astronauts at the Johnson Space Centre with NASA. So Canadians are very well, res very well respected and uh, very well thought of and very successful within the things they've done in NASA so far. So that really helped me out. It, it bought me respect when I first showed up there. And uh, that's all I attempt to do is try and contribute to that, to try and do my job as well as possible so that uh, Canada continues to have success and to get the respect of the people that, uh, that are in the business. And uh, what would you recommend to a person who's watching the show right now? To, uh, what would they have to do to get to be a Canadian astronaut? Uh, I would recommend that you find some area that you are interested in, some technical area that you think is exciting and worthwhile and interesting, and then get as expert at that area as you possibly can. Just find out everything you can and get yourself as trained in that area as, as anybody ever could. And then, who knows, maybe someday you'll get a chance to go to space, but along the way you will be in an area that you are excited about and uh, an area that you find interesting. And so even if you don't happen to get right to the end of the tunnel, you will still have, uh, have had an interesting trip along the way. And uh, your mission to the mirror, docking with the mirror, that was really exciting. Um, what do you see uh, for the International Space Station in the future? Uh, how do you see it being built, and uh, what role will Canada play in it? What we did on my space flight was to go and assemble a space station using the space shuttle. First time that's ever been done, to go use the Canada arm to build a structure on a space station. That is exactly what we're going to be doing to go build the International Space Station uh, a year and a half from right now. And so that's what Canada's role is going to be, and hopefully I'll have a chance to go do that, using the Canada arm and the space station arm to go up and build the International Space Station. With astronauts, we'll start off with the phases of the moon. Full moon is on the 3rd, last quarter is on the 9th, new moon is on the 17th, first quarter is on the 25th. This month's full moon is called the planting or milk moon. That really bright star over in the west is no star, it's the planet Venus. We've been watching Venus since the beginning of the year, but this is going to be your last opportunity of seeing that planet in the evening skies for the remainder of the year. Along about the 20th or so, Venus will be too close to the sun for easy observation. We will lose Venus until July when it reemerges from the sun glare, sun's glare in the morning around the 1st. So this is a, your last opportunity of seeing Venus. Notice how low it is in the sky on successive sunsets. It's a very fast moving object as it gets between us and the sun. Mercury, the innermost planet in our solar system, paid a brief visit to our evening skies last month. It's gone from our evening skies, but will be in our morning skies in June. The best time to see it in June will be around the 21st. We do get one more opportunity to see Mercury in the evening skies in August around the 21st. Mercury is a very difficult planet to watch, and if you are into planets, August the 21st would be a really good time to try and find it. Jupiter, the largest and second brightest planet in our solar system, is rising earlier and earlier these mornings. If you want to try and spot Jupiter, look for the moon on the 7th of May as it passes just a few degrees north of the planet. And while you're looking at Jupiter, don't forget your binoculars, because you can see upwards of four of its moons. On the morning of the 7th, three of those moons will be off to one side, on the east side of Jupiter. Those moons are Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Callisto, the fourth moon of Jupiter, is in front of the planet. You will need a telescope to see Callisto. We've lost Comet Hayakutake now for another 10,000 or more years, but there's one more comet coming in, Comet Hale-Bopp. 
Comet Hale-Bopp has re-emerged from the sun's glare in the morning skies and appears to be on schedule or even slightly ahead of schedule as far as brightness is concerned. So this bodes well for next April's apparition. There's something very rare that's going to happen with Hale-Bopp on the 8th of May. The moon will go in front of it. An occultation of a comet. Very rare. It hasn't happened in over a century with another comet. Now we can learn an awful lot about comets, the size of the nucleus and a few other things by watching the moon pass in front of it as seen from a bunch of different locations. Unfortunately, Canada is not one of those locations. We're going to miss this event. But the path of the occultation does pass over some very large, very important observatories, Kitt Peak and Mount Palomar. So we will be observing that event through some of the largest telescopes in the world. And we expect to learn an awful lot about the comet. The comet is ahead of, in brightness and is a binocular object now. And by the time summer ends, we should be able to see comet Hale-Bopp with the unaided eye. Well, that's it for Astro News for this month. And as near as we can tell, that's it for Astro News in the astronomy show for a long, long time to come. We've been canceled. But we're still here to give you astronomical information. You might want to consider joining the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. We meet on the second Tuesday of every month at the Planetarium Complex. Or if you want a, a more uh, immediate information about astronomy, give me a phone call at the Planetarium at 738-STAR, and we'll see what we can do for you. Until we meet again, I'm David Dodge. Well, hi there. Well, looking at the old watch, I see that we've come to the end of another season for the astronomy show. And gosh, time flies when you're having fun. You know, I'm just this summer I'm going to sit back and enjoy looking at the sky and just wait a minute. Where are these clouds coming in from? Not again. I can't believe this. That does it. I'm going to use my Cantel phone here. Just one second here. Operator, operator. I want to make a long distance call to Palm Springs and get me Sonny Bono. That's right, Sonny Bono Congressman. Hello, Sonny. Yeah, I'm Steve Fagley from the Royal Astronomical Society, Vancouver Center Chapter. Sonny, we'd uh, like to start a satellite chapter down there in Pond Springs where we can get some clear nights down there. That's right, we'd kind of like to share. Excuse me, I got a bad line here. I said share it. No, 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 that's spelled S-H-A-R-E, not C-H-E-R. Listen, Sonny, you could join the club. We could have a lot of fun down there. You could be a charter member for that matter because I'm telling you, up here in Vancouver, we just don't see the night sky. So, Sonny, we'll be down. Thanks very much.